with Sergeant Pepper and the Summer of Love and the expression of young people and all of these things really made 1967 just an incredibly powerful year. 67 for me was an absolutely crucial year. I think we thought this was a party. You couldn't see any end to it in 67, so you didn't want it to end. It did have to do with that sense that you could change things, and young people felt they could, and in fact did. London at that time was, it had a lot of possibility. You were coming out of, this, of a period when there was no possibility. This was the first period when you could actually transcend class, and you know, music, art, fashion was one of the ways in which people did that. When the truth is found. Giant protests were not only, not even so much the soldiers as their mothers. Because what the hell is my boy doing in Vietnam? The promises of the great society have been shot down on the battlefield of Vietnam. You, my enemy, my enemy is a white people, not Vietnams or Chinese or Japanese. He refused to step forward. He was sentenced to five years in jail. They took, they stripped his title. He gave young people the guts to come out against the war. Give me a ticket for an aeroplane. Ain't got time to take a fast train. Lonely days are gone, I'm a going home. My baby just wrote me a letter. The more I hear that song, it is a masterpiece. It does not have a coda, it doesn't have a riff, it is a blues song, it is a pop song, it is a jazz song, it is a folk song. 1967 for me was the big fight for free radio. You know, they call it the summer of love, but I missed out on two thirds of it because I was living the life of a sailor on a pirate ship on Radio Caravan. The thing about the the scene and the summer of love itself, which was a phenomenon. It was a moment. It was the greatest flash mob in history. London was the hit center of the universe in terms of bands, fashion, and experimentation. There were so many great clubs to choose from. There was the Bag of Nails Club, there was a speakeasy where all the groups used to go. Cromwellian Club was a big favourite, so we just used to head for the club. I mean, one of the things I did on my week off was I went to the UFO in Tottenham Court Road. And uh, you'd go down into this basement and, and there was all these uh, really weird light shows. This is where Joe Boyd, the American Svengali producer, would book bands like The Soft Machine and Pink Floyd, and they'd perform and there'd be these light shows. And a lot of LSD would be ingested, and it was really the sort of flowering of the beautiful people. And I think there was a period when, when UFO was at its height, there was this feeling that anything was possible. It was the first manifestation in, certainly in central London, of that ethos which became known as the kind of summer of love. I mean, I was going to France. You know, kids go to Thailand, you know, South America now. Uh, but going to France is as big a trip in those days. There were an interesting group of English people there. One of them's parents bought a house uh, on the harbour of Saint-Tropez. Of course, Saint-Tropez was nothing there, it was just a small fishing port. The first day we were there, we saw Bridget Bardot with a leopard on a, on a chain walking through the street, and we thought we'd gone to heaven and died. We thought it cannot get better than this. Sprint into springtime with a Mustang Sport Sprint sale at your Ford dealers. Those days, guys had cars, you know, these big. I mean, everybody loved the Mustang. I mean, if you got one, um, your dad had money. So the guys would show off by driving up in these red, engine red Ford Mustangs. Three new ways to take the Mustang pledge. Her choice, the Mustang hardtop, which is hard to top. An optional full-width seat with center armrest. 
And so we were all, us girls, were trying to find guys who had Mustangs because in the summertime, we could drive with the hood down by the lake. So I think it was the feeling of going to the prom um, and going with the guy I wanted to go with. Although I was quite bookish, so in a sense I wasn't, I only appealed to the intellectuals and the strange boys, you know, the really, <laughs> the, the radicals and, you know, people you, who did, wouldn't have a Mustang because it was like not on to own anything. And these guys were like, I'm gonna go live in a commune. I'm like not gonna have a job. because to her, I didn't have any clothes on. How did Twiggy strike you? Very refreshing. And her clothes? Adorable. She was extraordinary looking. I mean, she, you know, I, there was nothing that ever looked like Twiggy before. She was a working class shop girl. She was kind of otherworldly, you know, but she was, she, she was a gamin. She's quite boyish looking. I used to have a Saturday job at a hairdresser's where my sister worked and Justin's brother worked. Her parents were like, no, you're supposed to have hair and it's bouffant and it's puffed out like that and you aren't going around with your hair cut short and big eyes and looking like a superannuated five-year-old, which is what Twiggy looked like. When we think, you think back on it now. Taylor. Firebird is a stag. Brando. You disgust me. Elizabeth Taylor. Have you ever been collared and dragged out into the street and thrashed by a naked woman? Marlon Brando. I swear I'll do you! Reflections in a golden eye. We had tons of movie star magazines. I mean, it was all about Liz Taylor. Liz Taylor, Liz Taylor. And uh, the hair, the eyes. The lipstick. Reflections in a Golden Eye stars the Elizabeth Taylor who showed the world what a woman really is. I grew up in Chicago when the Playboy Mansion was there and Hugh Hefner had started the whole bunny thing. So that was also a look. It's the hair, 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 tits out to their lips, and be a Bond girl. What's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? Bond is back. 
And then you add on top of it, being a black woman. So we had to sort of, sort of recalibrate that through our own experience and our own kind of examples, which would have been the Supremes and Diana Ross, basically. I mean, the Supremes were actually uh, a black girl, hot, incredible group who could really sing, and Barry Gordy just kept ironing them out, ironing them out, you know, pull, ruffling the sheets, pressing them, pushing them down, throwing bleach on them. This is really a show tune, you know, you can hear it, you can definitely hear this on Broadway and in nightclubs and everything else, but it's kind of, it's celebrating the, the new hip culture, the, the new hip young culture, you know, the happening. In 1967, Prime Minister Harold Wilson applied for UK entry into the European Economic Community. NASA celebrated Surveyor 3, the first unmanned landing on the moon. You could not be a Marvin Gaye fan. The talent of, of people that came out of Motown, there's never been anything anything to touch that anywhere in the world since. Tamla was very much part of the music I loved, but with that pop infusion. And I just thought this is the most incredible music. White people felt comfortable singing soulish type songs and black people felt comfortable singing more pop. So it was starting to, because the, the Supremes were starting to sing pop, the Temptations were starting to sing pop. Um, and so right before the 70s when everything switched around, but this was so, you could see this starting to open up. Now at this point, we're going to leave Golden Gate Park to go into... There is no family so busy, but that it can come together in the evening for a dinner date which will give its members something to look back upon with.
have you taken LSD? Uh, four times. I don't know what everyone's so angry about. You know, when Paul McCartney acknowledged taking it, you know, it was blown up in all the newspapers. Shock, horror. You know, they, they busted the... ...off in a dangerous direction which nobody could understand. And it did have to do with drugs, but it also had to do with dress, it had to do with music, and, most important, it did have to do with that sense that you could change things. And young people felt they could, and in fact did. They all come out. 1967 for me was the big fight for free radio. You know, they call it the summer of love, but I missed out on two thirds of it because I was living the life of a sailor on a pirate ship on Radio Caroline. <laughs> I was already in the media by then, and I'd been introduced to a guy called Ronan O'Reilly, who had this revolutionary idea of lasting out pop music from a ship in international waters, which already sounded very glamorous. I defy anybody, I mean anybody in my generation, we were avid listeners to Radio Caroline. I mean, forget BBC, that was, it was old, old people stuff. So it was the only place you could actually hear all this new music. Of course, we all had our little transistors, radios, that, that were, uh, you know, another wonderful thing that you could have, because you had portable music. You know, I'd listen to Radio Caroline on that, and it would, <laughs> it would come and go. With, it was like the waves breaking sometimes, and then, you know, um, but you, you stuck with it because you admired them. They were doing something for us, it felt, against them. You know, in America, you had thousands of commercial stations. We didn't have many in this country. We only had the BBC, who had this idea of what was good for us and what we should hear, and more importantly, what we're not supposed to hear. People like Johnny Walker, you know, great, great DJs, and they would mix the stuff up. You know, you have Sam and Dave and Arthur Connolly, followed by, um, I don't know, Cream or something. You know, they didn't sort of separate it out because it was all great music and it was all happening at the time. And he would do something so I thought was very romantic. He would ask the listeners to park their cars on the coastline and flash their headlines out to sea so he could see them. And I always thought that was a... I think the whole of, to, to me, radio is a very romantic thing. I mean, there were huge numbers of records that may not have been hits at all. Groups and artists we may not have heard of, were it not for pirate radio. There were huge marches. Thousands of teenagers would descend on Trafalgar Square. There was a massive campaign to save the pirates, because the government threatened to bring in a law, the Marine Offences Act, which would become legal uh, just a minute past midnight on the 14th of August, 1967. And Radio Caroline was the only station that said, we're going to defy the government and keep on broadcasting. I think so many of these things which were played out very playfully in Britain, with fashion, with demonstrations, with rebellion, and were kind of amusing, and they were entertaining, and they made for a very lively arts, music, fashion, design scene in America. They were deadly serious, and they were much more threatening to the status quo, and much more unsettling to authority, and, uh, and the stakes seemed to be much higher. Promises of the great society have been shot down on the battlefield of Vietnam. You know, what Johnson called the great society, it was meant to be great for everyone. It wasn't meant to just be great for the middle-aged generation who'd, got, you know, who'd survived the, the Second World War, gone through that. It was meant to be great for their children too, and yet you had this, whole, this entire generation who were threatened by the war, they could have been drafted, they had that hanging over them, and it didn't make any sense to them. It wasn't this noble fight that World War II was. There's battle lines being drawn. It's a 
giant protests were not only, not even so much the soldiers as their mothers. Because what the hell is my boy doing in Vietnam? Television news was full of the latest war footage. No real surprise that most songs were a kind of dreaming and searching for a faith that things would get better. We didn't know the suffering that the soldiers on our side went through. We didn't know what they had inflicted as well on the, on the Viet Cong. We didn't know any of those things. We just knew that we were being sent to war by old guys. Were there any Americans who thought the Americans were going to win the war? So what are you doing in the jungle? I still remember his name. His name was Richard Penniman. He was like the class, I guess, clown and always happy. And he went to Vietnam, and he stepped on a landmine, and he was killed. And it resonated through our school. When you think about how many thousands of young American lives are sacrificed for that war, and really, what was it all about? We had no say in it at all. Just for us, a bunch of old people who were saying, you gotta go. Uh, if you didn't want to go, you either went to jail, like Muhammad Ali, or you went to Canada. The thing about Ali was that he was very articulate, so in spite of the fact that he was threatened with actually five years' imprisonment, which is what he could have been for refusing the draft, um, he gave very impassioned and very articulate speech as to why he wouldn't fight and didn't want to fight, because um, he did not regard uh, the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong as his enemy. You, my enemy, my enemy is a white people, not Viet Cong, or Chinese, or Japanese. Okay, that's all, just no comment on boxing, religion, induction, no comments on the weather, nothing. He refused to step forward. He was sentenced to five years in jail. They took, they stripped his title. While he was waiting for the Supreme Court to decide his case, he spent his time going to colleges, talked all over the country. He gave young people the guts to come out against the war. I remember Muhammad Ali said, no Viet Cong ever called me a nigger, so why am I gonna go and fight him? I'm not gonna fight him. So they took away his belt, his status, and he got convicted. I think 67 was the po turning point where huge swaths of America went, wait a minute, what are we doing? You know, Muhammad Ali opened their eyes. What do we got against these Vietnamese? Why are we killing them? And also he was a great athlete. He was very beautiful as well. So, you know, all of these things sort of welded together. Um, because when we were little kids, he was in his prime, he was fighting, and he won every fight. So he would, you know, if you're a little child and you're sitting there and some guy comes on the ring and says, I told him alive, I'm gonna get him in five, and then you get him in five, you're sitting there as a little kid going, yeah, you know, so he meant an awful lot to us, and his point of view is very important to us. Well, the Vietnam War was a huge shadow over which every young man faced, you know, you could be drafted. And that's absolutely terrifying. So I think that the, the, the hippie movement was a huge product of that. Certainly that was the golden age of the San Francisco Haight-Ashbury scene. And for that brief period, it was a kind of, it seemed like a sort of wonderland. But I think the wonderland was tempered by the fact that it, it, was by its, it had to be escapist because there was such a horrible fear of Vietnam. Level, you can talk about all the social changes, and the sexual revolution, anti-war protests and everything. But meanwhile, huge business was being done with the sale of LPs. The album was a statement. You know, before it would be that you know, you'd write your hit single and then you'd do a bunch of blues songs and live. And now it got to the point where bands were writing enough material to fill in the entire album and making their own statements. And, making, and, and so, you know, the album, the artwork, the sleeve notes, the lyric sheet, all that stuff, it became very, very important.
we'd all gather and, and sit around the, the stereo and listen to the whole album in silence. There was obviously a certain amount of competition, you know, who'd get the album first, whatever it happened to be next, you know, the new Jimi Hendrix album. Chaz Chandler of The Animals had seen him play in America, he said, I'll be your manager, brought him to the UK, got him on Track Records, which was the Who's label, um, and got him to be heard by the peer group. <laughs> By all accounts, as soon as he arrived, he was an absolute sensation. Played in front of Eric Clapton, and Eric Clapton sort of right, that's it, it's over. You know, there's nobody like this. Played in front of Pete Townsend, couldn't believe it. You know, and so all these guitar gods had suddenly, you know, had to sort of doff their cap to this incredible guy. And he developed here, you know. So early songs like Hey Joe, you know, the first album, Are You Experienced, all these things. It was, it was developed in Britain. So Jimi Hendrix was kind of introduced to the superstar straight away because everyone wanted to figure out this incredible talent he had with guitar. And I mean, you know, he could have regarded him as a threat because he was so much better than everybody else. I heard you shot your woman down, you shot her down now. Being a DJ at Radio Caroline, we'd do these Radio Caroline disco nights on land. We did one at the Wimbledon Palais, another one was the Chislehurst Caves. They put a little stage in there, a disco system, and they had a stage with a, a PA and bands used to play. And in fact, Jimi Hendrix played his first ever gig, uh, I think I'm right in saying it, in the Chislehurst Caves. On a Sunday afternoon. I used to go to the skating rink a lot and grooving was what you skated to. So you put your skates on, you rent your skates, and then they would put grooving on. And it was a good thing you could glide in your skates. And if you had a boyfriend, you could do like these two things to groove in. It was all deeply corny, but it was a good skating song, so it was really nice. Young Rascals are a great American band, and, and, and they came up with a record that, called Groovin grooving on a Sunday afternoon. What a perfect pop record that was. Anything we like to do. The Beatles had achieved huge success with Sgt. Pepper and were now caught up in the emotion of the time and how to achieve spirituality. It meant catching a train to Bangor, North Wales. At Wimbledon, the BBC made the first UK colour TV transmission. I've got an announcement to make. It's about Sir. Well, Sir, we'd all like to thank you very much for everything you've done for us. And we'd like to give you a little present to remember us by. Go on, Babs. You mean Miss Peg? <laughs> Babs. Go on. Go on. Go on. Interesting enough, the song that topped the charts in 1967 was Lulu, um, To Serve With Love, which came from the score of this film of the same name. It was a small Sydney Poitier film, partly because it was filmed in London. So it wouldn't have been, a, it wasn't a huge, huge mainstream film, but the song was. To get to Billboard Top 100 or to be in the number one, that means everybody was buying you, not just people who had been to Lulu's music. Everybody was buying this. Sidney Poitier had an unbelievable year in 1967. He made To Sew With Love, Guess Who's Coming To Dinner, and In The Heat Of The Night. In the heat of the night. You're pretty sure of yourself, ain't you, Virgil? Virgil, that's a funny name for a nigga boy that comes from Philadelphia. What do they call you up there? They call me Mr. Tibbs. Mr. Tibbs! Well, Mr. Wood, take Mr. Tibbs, take him down to the depot, and I mean boy like now. To see In the Heat of the Night 
about a racist Southern cop, a redneck, having to deal with this very educated black man who comes down and solves the crime, and he has to work with this guy who's like educated 3,000 times above anything Rod Steiger could be. It was a big movie. It was a big movie. You can get... James Brown invented everything. Let me just say that even before he was born, he invented stuff. Nobody has touched cold sweat. There have people who have attempted to touch cold sweat. There have been people who have come close to cold sweat. That was the mothership. That was the, the, the foundation record. You cannot underestimate the significance of James Brown. Who invented funk? Was it Sly Stone? Was it James Brown? I think it's James Brown. Intriguingly enough, although there was this movement towards um, peace and love and understanding, it, it coincided with, with quite a lot of international conflicts. Um, the Six Day War began in Israel, which again was a, was a fairly unpleasant uh, period. The Six Day War was a you know, huge headline news and obviously um, you were aware of the impact it was going to have on changing you know, the borders and politics in the Middle East. Again, I mean, we weren't really that politically involved, but you knew this was obviously a momentous event, really. Israel was extremely important for us. But I think the Six Day War began to change that a bit because Israel began to take territory. And that was something that went against our own idea of what it, Israel was. And we were caught up in Vietnam, too. Every black kid on planet Earth loves Stevie, and I was made to love her. It was just beautiful. It was a song you danced to at your prom. It was the song of the summer. It was a great, great, like Saturday Night at the Palladium. It was massive. If you got on that show, you cracked open everything. And Ed Sullivan was like this waxwork who had been around for sort of like 50 years, and he would come out and he'd go, no. The most interesting American music of 1967. It was a demarcation, and it was indication of the demarcation of our youth. The, the, the whole thing that we've been brought up in, and the whole thing we've been brought up to respect, it was over, over, over. Each night before you go to bed, my baby. Mothers and the Puppers were another band that captured the whole California vibe. Their harmonies were. were marvellous, classic. I mean, they were like the Beach Boys with girls. I mean, who didn't want to go to California because of California dreaming? Who, you couldn't not want to go there. I was desperate to get there. I was desperate to go to Monterey. Lou Adler and Andrew Lou Goldham cooked up the Monterey Pop Festival with a little help from the Mamas and Papas. This is John Phillips of the Mamas and Papas, and I'd like to talk to Dion. I had no idea that the Monterey Pop Festival was going to happen, but I wished I could have been there uh, to see Otis Redding. I mean, one of my big idols, one of my heroes of the 1960s was Otis Redding. I've been loving you too long. To stop now. For him to go to Monterey was really what catapulted Otis Redding to becoming as famous as he did. Otis Redding, in my mind, I think probably is the greatest soul singer of all time. I just love his voice. It was the year he did, did Monterey, and it was the year he did I've Been Loving You Too Long at Monterey, which is again one of the most beautiful songs. Please don't make me stop now. I love you. So I think Otis, you know, absolutely integral to the uh, the story of 1967. Not least because it was still quite a segregated time, and Otis had the the foresight to cross over into the predominantly white hippie culture.
showmanship, the flair. I mean, British groups all had this sense of showmanship, whereas Americans were like seriously playing the blues solo. And, and in a way, the first manifestation of this was Monterey, when all these groups that had, were sort of legendary in America, because they were in famous in Britain, were brought for the first time. I see people walking by, dressed in their colorful clothes. But the animals were, they were a, a raw British blues band who got involved in the early days of the American hippie scene. I could not foresee this thing ever happening to you, love. It was so competitive, really. The groups, they'd, they'd be real friends when they met each other, but my word, they did not, you know, try to outdo each other. Well, I made this documentary about Jimi Hendrix, and I have Pete Townsend talking about backstage at Monterey, where basically Hendrix says, I'm not going to follow you guys. You're too good on stage. And Townsend says, well, I'm not following you. You're way better than us. And finally, Hendrix says, well, look, I'm warning you. If I follow you, I'm going to pull out all the stops. And so the Who go on stage, and Townsend, you know, smashes his guitar. And, and the Americans had never seen anything like it. And then out comes Hendrix. <laughs> At the climax of his set, burns his guitar on stage. In a way, Monterey, you see so many things being presented to the mass American audience for the first time. You know, this English flamboyance in the form of the Who, this transatlantic weird blend um, of Hendrix and the show, and, and Otis and Janis. I mean, all of these together, in one place, in one weekend, in 1967. It was amazing. Uh, more generation. It was about a class thing and a social thing, and you could break through and do what you dreamed of doing without having had a very privileged background. Suddenly, there was a whole turnabout, and aristocrats wanted to employ working class people because of the Beatles, because of the Stones, because of that whole movement. You know, in that period of the 60s, there was a feeling that we could do anything. If you were young and you had ambition and you had drive, you could get out there and do whatever you wanted. It gave us all a moment in the sun to think that maybe, just maybe, if we did this and not that, then things would be a lot better. I mean, it was all about love. And it's a shame now, people are kind of shy and embarrassed to talk about love. But then it became known as the summer of love. If we want to talk about 1967, we have to talk about Jefferson Airplane. We have to talk about White Rabbit, Masterpiece. White Rabbit is a movie, it's a novel, it's an opera. It is the darkness that was about to come. One pill makes you larger. And one pill makes you small. Jefferson Airplane were very much a product of the politics of the time. They were a strident, revolutionary band born of the Haight-Ashbury scene. And even when you have songs like Somebody to Love and White Rabbit, there's, a, there's an edge of darkness there. I mean, a lot of people didn't, I think, realise what White Rabbit was about. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't have got airplay. We didn't know that the madness was coming, a lot of madness was coming down. We didn't know that. But Grace Slick and the airplane actually told us in so many ways that there was a dark side to this. And it was the other side of the summer of love. It was the other side. She said it was coming, they said it was coming, and it came. Despite all the demonstrations against the war, 
the US military continued the bombing of Vietnam and civil rights battles would escalate to cities across America. We will not tolerate lawlessness. Murder and arson have nothing to do with civil rights. 